Tonight, we are delighted to be joined by Westminster MBA graduate and CEO of the Scout Association, Matt Hyde. Being a scout myself for the last 15 years has taught me the fundamental skills of my leadership style. Tenacity, motivation, and creativity. Tenacity was taught to me when we cycled across Denmark to the Spideness Lear Jamboree in 2012. Every mile, another reminder that you can achieve your goal if you just keep going. Motivation is spending every summer building and dismantling a camp for 1,500 young people even when it's peaking 30 degrees, because delivering is the most rewarding feeling. And creativity is that any problem can be overcome with creative thinking. For example, borrowing a water supply from a local farmer when yours suddenly breaks overnight. It is my years as a scout that have taught me to be a leader, got me to be vice president here today, and led leading in other fields too. I can't wait to hear Matt's story, a truly wonderful leader of young people, both in the Scouts Association and the National Union of Students before. But that's enough from me. It is with great pleasure that I hand you over to tonight's What It Takes guest speaker, Matt Hyde. Right, thank you. Right, thank you, Dan. Uh, good evening, all. Thank you. Uh, is this on? Can you hear me OK at the back? Great, excellent. Um, look, it's, it's a massive pleasure to be back here tonight at uh, the University of Westminster. I have to say, it does rather bring back memories of exams uh, coming into this room, so slight trepidation made all the worse because my MBA director, Neil, is here tonight, and I haven't seen him for about 14 years, so it's fantastic to be back here. It's particularly uh, good to see you, Neil. Um, what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is uh, we're going to talk about leadership, okay? And... Um, I uh, wanted to st I'm going to give you a bit of my leadership journey, what happened in my career, and then uh, share some, some of my lessons of how I kind of developed along the way, but also a bit about um, things that I've noticed in leadership. And then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. I want to start by saying two things. The first thing is, I mean, this is quite a bold title, what it takes to be an effective leader. And I should say up front, that I do not pretend to have all the answers about what effective leadership is about. I have plenty of books uh, written about what great leadership looks like. If you want my two favorites, it's uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. And there's another great book uh, by uh, a, a guy called Steve Radcliffe called Leadership Plain and Simple. And that is a... Uh, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with Steve in, rec in recent years, and I'll use some of his thinking here and some of the uh, good to great thinking as well. So what I want to share with you is a good evening. That's absolutely fine. That's okay. One of the important things about leadership is thinking on your feet, okay? <laughs> Not being phased by the situation. Have a good night. Yes, all right. Um, <laughs> So what I want to um, share with you is things that I have um, learned from my, uh, from my experience, but also by observing others as well. Whether that I've been very lucky to work with some amazing uh, senior leaders, chief execs, um, uh, politicians, Bear Grylls. I should say, if you turned up tonight expecting to see Bear Grylls, I'm sorry. You've got me instead. We're quite different people. Uh, I grew up in a comprehensive school in the Fens. He grew up in uh, Eton. Um, I drink red wine. He drinks his own urine. That's kind of the uh, differences. But other than that, we're exactly the same, okay? But he's an amazing leader. He is one of the most inspiring people I have ever met in my life. And one of the things he does particularly well is engagement, and we'll come back to that. Second thing I want to say is, if I asked you in the room... How many of you see yourselves as leaders? Put your, put, see yourself as a leader. Put your hands up. Okay, so we've got a slight... Yeah, not, it's not a massive amount, is it? So, what I want you to get across tonight is for those of you particularly who didn't put your hand in the air, is that anyone can be a leader. Everyone. Here's the, here's, I'm going to let you into a secret here. That when I meet up with other chief execs and that, what you don't see is the fact that at the back of their minds, in their heads, they, ha they are riddled with insecurities. Because we all are, to some degree. There are things at the back of our head telling us that maybe we're not be good enough, 
maybe I won't good, do a good enough talk tonight. All of that stuff goes on in our heads. And one of, the, one of the arts, I think, one of the art or part of the art of being a good leader is being able to be at your best so you start to deal with some of those uncertainties and those insecurities. I think that's particularly true if you come from a background. If you came from a background where you uh, came from an amazing education system and a very stable background and you were connected with people in incredible networks, then you're very, very lucky. Most people aren't like that. And therefore, that's why things like universities are so powerful. It's like particularly why places like the University of Westminster are so important. But it's more than what you study. It's more than the exams you do. And I do worry sometimes when I see the education system in the UK going down a kind of exam factory. How you develop the softer skills you developed are absolutely critical to your success in life. And I don't just mean from a career point of view, but I mean from a relationship point of view, and put simply, a happiness point of view. I think we are at a really uh, interesting and worrying time in the country and the world. We live in a time of Brexit, of Trump, of, uh, of the first generation. This could be the first generation that stops extreme poverty and the last generation that is able to stop irreversible climate change. These are big issues in our time. Um, and I do think, and I was having a, col a conversation with colleagues, uh, other chief execs from the charity sector earlier, and I do think, if I'm honest, that there are a bit, some of the challenges with leadership are getting tougher. And one of the reasons why they're getting tougher is because of the digital revolution, and we're trying to cope with the introduction of AI, and we're trying to cope with how we cope ourselves to be effective leaders when uh, uh, I've lost my prop, which is my phone, when you're permanently glued to your phone. That's, maybe that's just me. Uh, I don't think it is. So um, that means that we really, really, really need good leaders. Now, if uh, I was to ask you, there was a, there was a study um, of, uh, uh, of leadership. And I want to go and talk to you a bit about that uh, and about what you what you think about leadership today. But if, I think it's probably best if we just start with a, um, this quote, which is for me what I, this is the best quote I've got on leadership, I think. Uh, the, other people can choose, choose others. But basically, this is John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams was a US president 150 years ago. And he said, if your actions inspire people to dream more, learn more, become more, then you are a leader. That, for me, is the essence of what good leadership, effective leadership, is about. And the best moments in my uh, career uh, or life have been when you have a conversation with someone in a moment or you see someone develop over a period of time in the same way that Dan said that could be as a Cub Scout leader and you watch a child develop over three years or it could be working with someone who is, a, um, who is your managing and you see them flourish over time, or you could be an MBA director and you see them flourishing over time. This is leadership for me. This is, that, this is the powerful essence of why we need great leaders at that time. Going back to the study I t um, told you about, the Brandon Hall uh, group did, uh, did a study on leadership development in 2015. And they asked people, and this is a study across the world, and it was of what people thought about leaders in their own organizations across all sectors from all over the world. And they said to them, uh, how well equipped do you think your leaders are to lead us positively into the future? What sort of percentage do you think there was that said that, there were, that they, were, they felt there were leaders who could lead us positively into the future? What sort of percentage? Shout out. Ideas? Ten. ten? Slightly more than ten. Twenty-nine percent. You've read my slides, haven't you? Yeah, it was twenty-nine percent. That was absolutely bang on. So that's pretty worrying, actually. That's a pretty worrying statistic. So the majority of people 
don't think we've got leaders who can lead us into the future, and yet we've got all these challenges. So, opening comments. Leadership matters. Your leadership matters. Anyone can be a leader. So, let me talk a bit about my leadership journey and how we got here. Um, there is a great quote from uh, Steve Jobs, the great Apple guru, sadly no longer with us, who in his Stanford commencement speech in 2005 uh, said, you can't j connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And for me, what, what I take from that is the idea that at the age of 15, 20, I would say, what do I want to be? I want to be chief executive of the Scouts is completely ludicrous. Now, if you're one of these people who know you want to be a doctor and you're on, like, on your path and you're going to go there and there'll be no problems along the way, then good for you. Uh, but actually, most people aren't like that. Most people bump their way along from chance happenings. They think they're going in this direction. They end up they're going in this direction. But if I, look, if I look at what my dots were going right back to the start of my leadership journey, it started in 1983 in the Scouts. Now, you kind of would expect me to say that, wouldn't you, as the Chief Executive of the Scouts? But it's true. This was the first time I ever uh, did, uh, undertook a leadership role. And it was uh, in, in uh, Cambridgeshire, in the, the Fens. Um, we didn't come from a, we certainly didn't come from a poor background, but we certainly, I mean, I was the first person to go to university in my family. Um, and for me, what that taught me was how to, what we could describe in scouting as learning by doing, it developed leadership skills by actually just getting me to take responsibility for others, working in small groups, working in teams. There was a study by the University of Edinburgh last year that showed that you were 15% less likely to suffer from mood disorders or anxiety later on in life if you'd been involved in scouts or guides. I mean, this is massive if you think how much money is going into mental health in this day and age. So why is that? Because actually you learn skills for life, you learn the practical character and employability skills by participating in activities like scouting and guiding. Now, normally at this point, so let me, do, let me do this other test now. This is the last bit of audience participation, just to reassure you, unless you want to take part in the Q&A. Uh, how many, of you, how many in the audience, put your hand up if you were either a scout or a guide or a cadet. Okay. Now, my judgment on this is, is, is I've got an interest, and so not many, okay? When I, go to room of, when I go to a room of charity chief execs, almost every hand goes up in the air. When I go to uh, a room full of politicians, almost every hand goes up in the air. So there is something about, so we, it could just be that we're, you know, attracting loads of middle class kids, which is which is true, okay? Um, but one of the efforts, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, but it's been absolutely my focus in the four and a half years that I've been there to ensure that scouting should be for everyone and to work far, far, far harder at going into areas of deprivation. Why is that important? Because this stuff matters to your life chances. Now, here's the good news, for those of you who didn't put your hand up. You can do this at any point. You can go and volunteer tomorrow. You can go and be a trustee tomorrow. And that is the stuff that will help you in terms of your leadership journey by finessing your skills, but also bringing you, just helping you to think and put yourself in that leadership space. And it isn't just about turning up to lessons and getting a 2-1 or a first. I promise you it's not. The job market is too competitive. We also know now that if you are 50% more likely to volunteer, or undertake social action if you participated in social action before the age of 10 or 11. So again, there's a big focus from my aim in terms of, in terms of social mobility in the country to get more kids doing stuff like this, because it matters. Um, I went to, um, uh, uh, from uh, Scouts, one of the things I did in Scouts was I got into football, bizarrely enough. Uh, and then from that, I ended up, uh, going, when I went to university, I, uh, my undergraduate degree was at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and I captained uh, Queen Mary's uh, uh, 15. Um, so um, the Queen Mary fifth football team, it was the worst football team ever. We lost every game in a season. 
apart from a nil-nil draw where we did a lap of honour. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, one game we lost 16-0, I remember. Um, but that is a classic example again of... I mean, I learned some amazing stuff in my undergraduate degree. Absolutely amazing. But I learned as much about leadership, if not more about leadership, from trying to motivate a team that was losing every game and keeping people, uh, keeping the spirit and the camaraderie as I did on anything else. So le you learn leadership in different shapes and sizes. You, in my experience, you don't learn it from a book. Sorry to the MBA director. Uh, but uh, it's true, okay? You can learn some tools that help you, absolutely. But the only way you really learn leadership is like a muscle, you've got to exercise it. So uh, I went from that, I went, because I was in the football team, I became the, the president of my student union um, at uh, Queen Mary. Student unions are amazing places. They are, I can't speak highly enough of them. They are leadership incubators. Because you end up being in a situation, if you're a student officer, where you can be responsible. You're, on a tr you're, you're a trustee at the age of, what, 21 or something. You learn how to, uh, you're responsible for a multi-million pound uh, organization. You've got the safety net of trialing things out um, in, a, in a safe space where you've got staff to support you. And you've got, um, you can advocate for people, you can create change, and you can make, make um, uh, you can make errors in a safer space. And one of the conversations we were having earlier with Dan, it's like, you know, I've got, I've got loads of challenges. You, know, you always have loads of challenges. Leadership's, leadership, you will always have challenges. It's learning about how to cope with those and recover from them quickly. One of the things that uh, I learned uh, uh, at Queen Mary, and again, I, I, I suddenly found myself in circles whereby I came with, I was in a, an environment with people with different social capital. So people who were frankly uh, richer and um, uh, came from uh, posher backgrounds than I did. And it's very, it's very uh, easy in that environment to be quite intimidated by it. There was an incredible lecturer that I had, um, again, sadly, no longer with us, a woman called uh, Lisa Jardy, one of the most impressive feminists, of the, in my view, of the last 40 years. And one of the things that Lisa said to me was, I remember trying to talk in a council meeting in a, at a university and feeling quite intimidated by it, and sort of, you know, meekly trying to put my uh, hand in the air. She was talking about how you build confidence in those situations. So you might have situations where you're in a committee, you're in a meeting, and you realize you're the p only person not to have said anything. And you slightly feel uncomfortable. And then you leave and you think, I should have said something, I should have said something. And one of the things Lisa said to me, and it's a really practical thing I think that again, I still use today, is that when you go into a room, get your voice in the room. And that could be as simple as saying, always oh, a bit hot in here, do you mind opening the window? Or can I have a glass of water, please? Because then that's the first time you've spoken. So that is that, that rather than waiting for that moment in the meeting and then when you speak, your voice goes a bit, you know, the, actually that's the first time you've actually spoken. It's a really practical tip that I've used um, for years after that. So uh, I had a great, a great experience at Queen Mary. I went to, after that, the University of London Union. The University of London Union uh, is kind of not really with us anymore, is it? 100,000 students are represented there. We um, campaigned uh, for, uh, successfully <coughs> campaigned for a student discount scheme. Uh, still in place today, 30% off for students. Uh, we won that. That was quite, it was about, uh, quite fortuitous. So I was in the right place at the right time. So I got my kind of name on the sort of, uh, uh, on the scene as being leading that campaign. I did do a bit of work as well, I have to say, but anyway. Um, um, and I think I learnt, what I learned from that and I got from that point was I started to build my networks and I learned from the chief executive. And the chief executive is a woman called Leslie Dixon who runs a charity called PSS now in Liverpool. And from that, I, learnt, I just observed the way she did things, the way she worked with people, the way she got the best out of people. You might have experiences in your life where you work with really crap bosses. You can learn as much from crap bosses as really good ones. Because you can learn from the fact that you think, do you know what, if I'm in that position or I'm a manager, I'm not going to do it like that. So you can absorb that and reflect on it. But you've got to be able to sort of observe it, listen and reflect. I went from there to King's College London Student Union, King's College London Student Union. 
I became, I went on the staff side, I became deputy chief exec. In the time I was there, we had a massive flood that wiped out all our student facilities. Uh, so I learned how to uh, respond to setbacks. What I also did at that point is I started to do my MBA. And then 18 months later, I was headhunted to become chief exec at Goldsmith Student Union. And I was able to apply the learning from the MBA to that experience. So the reason why the MBA was so good for me is I describe it a bit like the decathlon. Okay? There are lots of different disciplines. You're not going to be good at all of them. But it, it forces you to work walk towards those elements that you're not so good at. So my takeaway here is walk towards the bits that you're not so good at if you want to become a great leader. So if you're not good at that, if you don't know much about digital transformation, you're going to need to know about digital transformation in the future. If you're not so strong on numbers, I did an English degree, right? Um, one of the reasons why I did an MBA was because I wanted to get better at learning about finances and the language of accountancy and law. So that's the reason why I did my MBA. And you don't have to do an MBA, so there's different ways to do it, although it's a very good MBA. Um, the other thing I did at Goldsmiths was Goldsmiths was 15 staff, a million pound turnover. And I was not just able to apply that learning, but I, the great thing about that was I was able to get really into the detail of how a business worked. So when someone raises the invoice, where does, how does it end up there in the accounts? So yes, you can do all the big stuff like this and stand and talk in front of people. And I'd learned a lot of that as a student officer. But it allowed me to, I think in leadership sometimes you need to hover and then be able to go down. And you have to do this thing about keeping your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. So be able, to ha be able to look strategically, but be able to drill down into the detail when you need to. And I still do that today. Five years in from Goldsmiths, if I'm honest, I thought I'd left it too late. I thought I was stuck in Goldsmiths Student Union for the rest of my life. So if you have those, you will have those moments in your career where you think, why did I get here? I went for jobs and didn't get them. And then someone approached me about the National Union of Students. There was a woman called Kat Fletcher. She now works in Jeremy Corbyn's office, would you believe? And um, I went to become deputy chief exec at uh, the National Union of Students. I was there for six weeks, and my boss resigned, and I became the fifth chief exec in as many years. It was the most dysfunctional organization in the country at that time, I believe. It was more dysfunctional than any case study I was given on my MBA. So uh, what do I mean by that? 20% of the staff had a grievance out. 20%. That's a lot of unhappy people. Ten, it had 10 years of deficits. It was selling buildings to pay off the overdraft. Uh, the governance was completely flawed. There were 30 student officers, all well-intentioned. None of them discussed how to, what was going on in terms of the running of the organization. None of them actually discussed much about student issues as far as I was concerned. And from that, we had to raise everything to the ground. And it was complete transformational change. We had to go in, and the first thing we had to do was to go to student unions, people like Dan, and throw ourselves on their mercy and be honest about how bad things were. And I think too little in, uh, in leadership these days, and it's partly, I think, because we're so frightened that the press will get on our case. Sometimes you've just got to be honest and say, do you know what? This is dreadful. But this is what it will look like when it's better. And that's what we did. And within seven years, we had um, more than tripled the turnover. We saved students two billion pounds over that period. And student groups that weren't always the most uh, high profile or popular, we saved, as far as I'm concerned, we saved a load of international students from being deported from, uh, uh, from London Met in my last six months there. We kept funding for young people who are uh, teenagers, who'd got uh, uh, teenage parents, to ensure that they were still being funded as well. The stories that people don't hear about students today, rather than the cliches that you fit here in the, um, see in the, in the media. So it was great. And after seven years, it was felt like the right time to move on. And I went to the Scouts. And the Scouts today is celebrating its 12th consecutive year of growth. We have 55,000, we have 457,000 young people and 154,000 adult volunteers who are the amazing people who make this work, 330 staff. 
8,000 separate charities. And we have, uh, we've got 55,000 young people on our waiting list who can't join because we don't have enough adult volunteers. And our focus, as I said earlier, has been on ensuring that scouting is for everyone. So we've gone from 22% girls and women to 27%. We've led the way on issues like um, sexual, sexual orientation and transgender issues. And we're proud of that. And we have, uh, in addition, open scouting in 460 areas of deprivation that we weren't in uh, four years ago. So that's a bit about scouting today. And the whole focus about that was we, I wanted to take an organ I didn't want to do turnaround again. I wanted to go from good, uh, take an organization and take it from good to great. So two more slides. Uh, first thing, leadership. Right, so what, what are my takeaways? Along the way, I had mentors. I had people, they weren't always formally mentors, but I had people who were there to advise me and coach me, uh, advise me on what to do in difficult situations. I also, when I went to uh, NUS, uh, had coaches for the first time. Now, the difference between a coach and a, 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 a mentor is a mentor will be probably someone who's been there before who can say, hmm, I'd do this, I'd do that. A coach will ask you questions to help you solve your own problems. And I was completely skeptical about coaches until I used them at NUS, and I found it absolutely transformational to give me the space to think. And that's really hard when you're in a busy role um, like the one I've got. Uh, action learning sets. Uh, or, as I, as that, so that's spending time with people like you. I th I'm sure you do this sort of stuff on uh, uh, at the business school. Spending time in groups, solving problems together, and then as you uh, progress, now I do that with a load of chief execs, so we come together to share common problems. Support team, my support team is my senior leadership team at the moment, but I also have another a load of touch points I can rely on outside of, um, uh, outside of the workplace as well. You need champions. Everyone should be able to have a champion. Someone who's just able to say, you know, you should do that. I realized uh, at one point in my career, most of my career choices were because someone had said, you should do that. And I hadn't necessarily thought of it. That, go back to the definition I gave of leadership earlier on. A trustee, NED roles, and, and uh, non-exec roles, I can't stress strongly enough how important those are for your own development. And volunteering, I would add into that mix as well. What are you doing outside of the formal environment, not just from a CV point of view, but because you'll get stuff out of it. You'll learn. You're, it will make you happy. I promise you. Um, and then and formal learning as well. So whether that be the MBA, MBA whether that be a course on uh, digital, whether that be a course on training, whatever it is, you still need to learn continually to make sure you're, you're learning throughout your life. So what I'd like to say at this point is just to ref my, these are my takeaways. This is what worked for me. Reflect for yourselves on which of those you think you're doing and which you're not doing and which you might want to do when you leave the room. Otherwise, this has just been a, a waste of your hour. I'm sorry. But, um, you know, it, it only works if you actually sort of take stuff on board. And there should be always something you can take away with this stuff. Um, Look, what have I, what have I, this is, these are kind of some common themes here in terms of things I've learned. Uh, one of the mantras of Steve Radcliffe's book is future, engage, deliver. I think that is a, the simplest definition of how you lead people as, as you can. Future. Build a positive future. Fill, build a future. Describe a future in 3D. Explain what it looks like. Because what happens when you start building a future is you get lots of positive energy. Think about what you're doing at Christmas. Think about what you're doing for your next holiday. Think about what, what could that now apply, how could that apply to your work environment? How could it apply to your life? Build that future, and if you build something together, that's even more exciting. Because if you build it together, the second bit becomes easier, which is engage. Now, the thing I learned more than anything else about Scouts was the importance of engagement. And I thought I was brilliant at this stuff. I thought I was really, really good at engagement. And actually, I realized that 
you have to work 10 times harder because it is the ability to spend time with people, look them in the eye, engage with them, understand, listen who they are, listen to what they're saying, and think about how you're going to get the best out of them. So one of the things, uh, uh, and, th and that is about honesty as well. So one of the things we do every week, every month, is I have an all-staff um, meeting. We broadcast this across all of our sites. Um, uh, webcast it, so anyone can dial in, whether you're, uh, whether you're um, uh, in Scotland or in our region offices or down on the south coast, uh, our trading companies. Anyone is able to ask a question anonymously. And we get some diverse and fanciful uh, questions. But I'm, I answer them directly. And that could be as simple as saying, why are you asking that? But the, here's the, uh, and it could also be, do you know that's a really good point? And I don't know the answer and we'll take it away. That is one of the simplest things we've done in the last uh, two years that was absolutely transformational. Because I think there is an expectation, rightly or wrongly now, that people want to see their leaders, they want them to be visible. That doesn't mean to say you micromanage everyone, but they want some visibility and they want to see your senior leadership team. And as a senior leadership team, we now share it out as well. So um, uh, engage, 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 and then deliver. Don't give up. Bear grills, never give up. Uh, focus on uh, relentlessly and tenaciously on achieving your goals. And if you get knocked off, if you get knocked sideways, which I've had a bit of recently, then just get back on track and focus again and deliver and, and, and be clear on what success looks like because then you're more likely to deliver it. Um, values, again, one of these things where how many places you go into and they see, you see values on the wall and you think, oh, vomit. You know, I kind of just think some of this, I, again, values was one of these things that um, I was a bit dismissive of. But actually, values is about behaviours. Values is about what you see when you go into place and how you're treated and how consistently you're treated. It's about how people talk about the culture. In that quote about what happens when you're not in the room. It's about, it's a feeling, I think, of values. And for me, really strong organizations have values running down them like Blackpool through a stick of rock. You can see it in the scout movement. And actually, they're quite good anchors, because when people don't behave within the values, you can say, you're not acting within the values. Actually, that's not on. <coughs> that's not on. We get, yeah, Dan will know this, but um, you sometimes get these really, really, really aggressive hostile emails from people and then at the end they put yours in scouting like it's fine. It's like, that's not fine. That's just rude. <laughs> um, and the other thing I get is, um, the, the, the thing I would just take away on this, and it's, this is really important I think, is you often find people are really good at completing their objectives but their values are completely unacceptable. I would get those people off the bus. It does not, it, it's not, right, because people judge you as a leader by the company you keep. And so uh, it's really important for me that you are really clear. These are the values. And that doesn't mean to say you won't give people feedback on it. But there comes a point where if they're not then adhering to those values, they're not part of the journey. Which goes to the next phrase, which is Jim Collins, about get the right people on the bus. Surround yourself by excellent people. If you want to be excellent, surround yourself by excellent people. Think about sports teams. You know, you, anyone who's played sport, and if you play in a team sport, then you're more likely to raise your game if you're playing with good people, right? It's exactly the same in the workplace. Um, be yourself. Be who you are, and be authentic in who you are. Don't try and be, don't try and do this like I'm doing this. I'm, I, but equally, do it how you can do it. That means that, if, particularly if you're more, I've got in more introverted style. There are some incredible leaders in this country who have more of an introverted style, but do it your way. Don't try and learn from other people, but don't try and copy their style, I think I'd just say, because then you can have, it's, it's so much of this is about trust and honesty, if I'm honest. Look after yourself. And this is, if nothing else, you take nothing away tonight. <laughs> Look after yourself. Why do I say that? Because. The sort of job that I do, and, any, and I think increasingly any job, is so relentless. It is 24 hour, seven days a week. And if you try and keep up, you will collapse. But not only that, 
and I really learned this at NUS, unless you look after your physical health, what you eat, what you drink, how many nights you go out, how much sleep you have, you will not be an effective leader. Detaching yourself from your phone and, and taking time away from social media is absolutely critical and we should teach it in schools. Because if the, only if you can do that can you be well enough so that when you're having a conversation with someone as a leader, you're not sat there thinking, I'm so tired or I'm, I'm more anxious you can focus on the individual and get the best out on them. So you have to be at your best in order to get the best out of other people. And finally, just because it's a scout motto, I had to put be prepared up there. But in addition to that, um, I do think there's something about, uh, there is something about hard work. There is something about, there is something about learning from mistakes. So prepare, prepare ahead. But then when things don't go right, don't, don't go well, don't smet the, don't sweat the small stuff. Okay, just learn from it. There will be loads of things that won't go right. Just take it on board, learn from it, and get back on the saddle. And if you've got passion and belief, and you're working tenaciously, and you're learning from your mistakes, then you can do what our founder said, which was to leave the world a, uh, a little bit better than you found it. Thanks very much. Thank you for that, Matt. That was really interesting. I was kind of lost in another world there for a second. <laughs> um, so we're going to do some Q&A now. So if you have a question for Matt, just put your hand up and someone will run with a microphone to you. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone? He's not going to bite, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, just over there. Matt, thank you for that. Um, on behalf of our MBAs, we have on our, our MBA program a space for risk, and it's deliberately designed to help people stretch out of their comfort zone. If you were looking at a, a way to stretch out of your comfort zone now, what might that be? Gosh, what a good question. Um, so um, let, me t um, let me, if I can answer um, my own question, then I'll answer yours if that's okay, which is, uh, we've been talking a lot about risk at the moment. And, um, and what's your risk appetite and how you approach risk and you, you know and I have to be honest with you I, when you're in an organization like uh, when you're working with 450,000 kids um, your life is rather consumed by risk and um, uh, whether that's about keeping kids safe or whether it's about understanding um, uh, a lot of the activities we do are kind of outdoors they're slightly more dangerous so um, so uh, there's, there's that component to it. We also work in a far, far more regulated environment. And uh, uh, particularly in the charity sector, I have to say. And again, this is exactly the conversations I'm having with colleagues at the moment. And I'm, I worry that um, in order to compete and grow and innovate, you have to take risk. And yet if you work in a regulated environment that stifles that, we will not have the charities we need and the not-for-profits we need to help solve some of the country's and world's problems or play an active role in that. So that's just my general bit on, on risk at the moment. Um, in terms of the risk, uh, the sort of risks I take uh, and, and the sort of things that I, I do, um, uh, when you spend time with Bear Grylls, uh, you do end up in more risky situations than you would normally. Um, uh, but um, uh, I uh, try and, as much as I can, learn new things, which is not quite the same as risk-taking, but I think it's exercising a different, a similar part of the brain. So that could be learning stuff around cooking. Uh, it could be um, uh, just going to different experiences and making your brain think, sort of work laterally. Um, uh, and... Uh, I was thinking about this earlier in the year, I mean, we, you know, w there's a f couple of things recently which I can't really go into because of <laughs> the regulated environment I'm in, but where we have taken more risks in order to take more, um, in order to advance the organisation. I think that the part of the thing about the risk premium is 
is, is a thoughtful understanding of is it going to forward your mission significantly or not, balanced again, how bad will it be if it goes wrong? And um, again, I think we, one of the things we do in scouting is we, uh, we encourage kids to take risks from day one. So, we, you know, so, and that, that extends into whether that be uh, going caving or abseiling to using a knife for the first time. I think that is an important part of our, our brain that we, we don't um, cultivate and therefore we stifle the creativity of young people as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, hi, my name is Moise. And Moise. Um, when you were speaking about soft skills mm. being vital to your success as an effective leader, were you speaking about the interaction with other people and just so being more social? Or was it more on um, emotional intelligence and things like that? That's a really good question. Um, really good question. So I suppose if I was, so I, we kind of separate it. In, when we talk about it in Skeleton, we talk about practical character and employability skills. Um, so that's your ability to work in a team, your ability to listen and communicate, um, your ability, and that part of that is about um, emotional intelligence because it's your, um, which I think is closely aligned to your political antennae. So um, being able to read people. Um, so if you're, in a, if you're in a sort of team environment and you, you realize there's someone whose body language is a bit uncomfortable, being, being alert to that is actually quite important. Because, and then having the confidence, which comes from some of that stuff as well, to go, hang on, you, you, you seem not to be OK about this. Do we need to talk about it? Um, so I think it's, uh, uh, th th those are some of the softer skills. And we know that employers are looking at today as well. And the ability to. Um, The ability to put yourself across in a way that an employer or an interviewer or a customer wants to interact with you and, th and thinks that you're treating them with respect. I mean, these are some real basics, I know. But um, I do think it really, really matters. And they're the sort of things that people look at because they look for then connections as well. Now, how you, the challenge with this is sometimes what people are doing is they're looking for similar traits to the, what they've got themselves. So it doesn't always work. So I think there are challenges around uh, diversity here as well. And one of the things that we've been doing work on at, um, at the Scouts is around uh, understanding about unconscious bias, understanding about um, how you can create a recruitment process that brings in your widest pool of people as possible and is able to, uh, uh, and to in order to um, not prejudice and, and limit a pool of, of really impressive people because you're looking for certain traits within that. Um, but actually, but, you know, fundamentally, some of those softer skills, uh, are, I, I still believe, are absolutely critical to get on in life. So y the days when you used to get a first and you walked into a job, I think, are gone. But if you have a first and therefore you can show you've done this and you've, uh, you, even that stuff around resilience, you know, Dan said it earlier, if you've been on an expedition and you can prove that and you can talk about it, you are, I think, much, much more likely to be able to um, get into a, uh, uh, to get into a job uh, opportunity than somebody who hasn't. Do we have any more? Hi, Matt. Um, my name's Jim. Um, okay. Just curious, really, are there any particular leaders that have inspired you or do inspire you? And in what way have they been an inspiration for you? Um, oh, gosh, loads. I mean, I, um, I suppose one of the most impressive, I, I, I get very, uh, I think when politicians are able to get cut through, 
on any stage, particularly in a um, in a busy world where it's uh, driven by social media. Um, so uh, for me, I think Obama was just sensational in his ability to um, use the right word. I mean, it, it, I'm always taken by great speakers, but people who've got a, a moral compass and values who can articulate what they're trying to do in a way that connects with you. Um, and God knows, I mean, frankly, you know, I mean, now we really do know what we had, don't we? So, um, so, so people like that. I, I, it is a cliche when I talk about Bear, but I, um, he, I, I, I learn from him all the time. Because in, in a way that when I, if, if, I, mean, I kind of joked about this earlier, but I mean, we are quite different people, and yet we've really connect. The reason why we connect, and it's, um, he's very, very generous. He, um, what you see is what you get. So back to the point about um, authenticity. His faith is very important to him. His family is very important to him. And that's not just a, that's not a brown bear. That is bear. Um, he also, um, when he's with people, you see this particularly with scouts. Have you ever met him? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So I don't know about this, whether you say this as well. When he's, when he's, with, he's absolutely, you are front and center. You are the only person in the room or the world that matters at that moment. And that's a gift in my experience. That's very few people, I think. I've met some very, very talented politicians who are great speakers but can't do that. And actually, all they're generally doing is looking over someone's shoulder for the next most important person. Um, and uh, so I think you've got that, the combination of all of that. He also has, I mean, his brain is going 24 hours a day with a new idea. Um, uh, and so, uh, but it, the, the other thing he does, goes back to this as well, is um, the Jim Collins thing, is he surrounds himself by brilliant people with great values. So his, the people in Bear Grylls Ventures, which is the kind of machine now, now he's got a 450 million audience in China and you know, bigger in the States than he is over here and all of that, um, is, is surround yourself by a small group of really, really impressive but values-based people. So I, I've, learned, I've learned a lot from him. A lot from him. So they're the two that come to mind. I'm sorry they're both men. I apologise for that. Uh. Any more? Yeah, just over here. Uh, while we're bringing it over, I'm just going to ask you, Matt. Yeah. What's the moment where you've thought you've been the most effective leader? Has there been a situation that's made you think, ah, oh, do you know what? I kind of got this. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I can kind of answer that, which is. Um, I do think leadership's about perspective as well. So I can tell you the day that was probably the most challenging leadership moment and therefore kind of answers that question, which is it was the 10th of November 2010. Some of you may remember there was a small, we had a demonstration in central London when I was at NUS about tuition fees. And um, we were riding high at the time. We'd had a campaign. Um, whereby uh, we asked uh, politicians to, there's some nodding in the room, were you on the demonstration? No, I was at uni at the time. Right? You were at uni at the time. Yeah, no. um, where we got, uh, uh, we asked politicians to sign a pledge about not raising tuition fees, remember that? And uh, loads of people signed it, and mainly Liberal Democrats mainly signed it. Um, and, uh, uh, and then what happened was, there was a demonstration around that, 52,000 people on the streets of London. Uh, there was a breakaway group. Uh, the breakaway group went into Millbank Tower uh, and trashed the Conservative Party headquarters and the Charity Commission. Uh, given that student unions are all charities, that wasn't uh, ideal. Um, and then what happened was uh, people started throwing fire extinguishers off the top of a building and it missed a police officer by, I've seen the footage about that much. The other bit of the story is that two weeks before my wife had been very seriously ill and uh, I was having a bit of a relapse on that day. She's absolutely fine now. And I remember thinking at that moment, um, as long as no one dies here, we'll probably be all right. And no one did die, thank God. Um, but I think there's something about perspective in all things. 
And there's something about the ability to just get through situations and at least appear to be calm in those situations. Because in particularly in times of crisis, people want to look to someone who's got a steady hand on the tiller. <coughs> and those are the moments where I do think you think, this is a leadership moment. Um, but at the time, you're just thinking, what the hell are we going to do and how are we going to get through it? So there's a question here. Hi, uh, I'm Veronica, Hi, Veronica, and my question is, uh, how do you go about becoming a leader, but within an exi existing organization? So, for example, letting your employers know that you would like to lead a department. Great. Um, so, I would be, so if a good manager will be having that conversation with you already. So a good ma if, you're in a, if you're in a place where you've been managed by someone, so a good manager will be looking for what are your career aspirations and how do we help you get there. So, and what do you need in order to get there? What are your gaps? And therefore, what learning and development, what training do you need? What support do you need? Um, and then ideally, they would help to um, uh, give you a personal development plan that get you, got you on that journey. If that doesn't happen, you might have to raise that conversation with them. Uh, if that doesn't happen, you might have to speak to your HR department. If that doesn't happen, you might have to speak to the, the manager of the manager. And then, ultimately, if you start to deploy some of the things that I've talked about in terms of um, acting as a, a, a leader and diligently, you will be noticed as well. And so, um, but, I, but don't wait for that have that conversation if that conversation has not been had with you. Thank you. Okay. okay, I think we've got time for one more. So does anyone else have anything to ask Matt while he's here? Yeah. Hi, my name Hi. is Paula. I just Hi. wanted to ask you, um, do you think it's only scouts can prepare you for, um, for, for life? No. Have, give you their life skills, yeah. or is it a problem with the schooling system that uh, it doesn't really prepare people for for life? Uh, uh, well, I, I completely so no. Whilst I I'm, will always do the advert for the scouts, it would be quite overclaiming, I think, to say that the only way you'll get this is through the scouts. I think there's something that happens. Um, so so it, like, ultimately, in an ideal world, we would have an education system that produces round rounded and grounded pupils equipped to face whatever um, is thrown at them in the world. Um, and I would always start from a place where effective public services and state provision is the best way of ensuring universi universality so that you can develop character in the classroom, you can have um, opportunities um, that aren't just about uh, literacy and numeracy. But inevitably, there's a there is a focus on literacy and numeracy because there are, there's, we've got a problem with literacy and numeracy in the country. So I didn't get that. Um, and, if, and of course, if you're in, it's a postcode lottery ultimately because actually if you're, in a, uh, if you're in the home counties, you're more likely to have better life chances than you are in Glasgow. And a lot of that, then, you're going to have a different education system as well. I should say the Scottish system of curriculum for excellence does recognise what you do inside and outside the classroom as part of, your, um, as part of the curriculum. And I think, is, personally, is the way I would go. I would go from far more of a Scandinavian model than what we've got here. But anyway, that's personal. It's a little bit political. Um, because the, but even if you do that, even if you do that, you have the lottery of where you are and where you're born. So let me give you the example I always give, and the reason, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about scouting is because I was the lucky one. I was brought into my father's small shop when I was born, uh, and born, and there was a member of the travelling community there who said, he's the clever one. So at that moment, so I, I wasn't even one. So I was scripted at that point as being the clever one. And lo and behold, I just think I got loads of messages saying, well, he's very, very bright, isn't he? And therefore, I was more academically minded when I went to university and when I went to school. My brothers were not academically minded. 
and I think the state system failed them, but the thing that got them to where they are today was scouting. Because when they were getting loads of negative messages and leaving with a CSC and an O level in those days, there was something outside where people were championing them and giving them, building their social capital, giving the confidence, giving the skills that they weren't getting, telling them what they were good at, not what they weren't good at. And I think that has got to them to where they are today. So for me, um, so I think there is something about the power of what happens outside of the classroom as well as what happens inside it that is very powerful. So the question is, if you look to that in policy terms, is how do you ensure that everyone gets those opportunities outside of the classroom? Or the other thing we're now doing is taking scouting into schools. So there's a primary school in Kent where on Friday afternoon, every one of them does scouting. They all change into their uniforms, their leaders come in, the teachers turn into leaders. And, what we, and the reason for that is, and this isn't like kind of going to be the sort of default model, although it is in Indonesia and Singapore and Malaysia, where you do PE and then you'll do scouting or uniformed organisations. Um, um, what I learnt was that when I went to the Page Hall area of Sheffield where we'd, done, we'd put, done scouting as after school provision, and there were kids from the Roma community there, and no agency had been able to reach those kids. If we'd have said, come back at 7 o'clock to the scout hut around the corner, we would never have seen those kids. But because we bolted it on, onto the school day, we were, managed, we were able to bring, that, uh, to bring scouting to those, those young people. So I think there is a mix of, and I think good policy would be a mix of, um, school and non-formal organisations working together. And my fact, personally, and this is, I don't think there's any journalists in the room, personally I would give a voucher, I would find some way of giving funding to young people who otherwise can't access those opportunities to get those opportunities. You can use pupil, pupil premium funding at the moment, but it doesn't go far enough, in my view. Perfect, okay, well before we finish, a big thank you to Matt. Thank you.